uh, really set its trajectory and path and values and a huge um, uh, person to, to, to try and emulate as the, uh, as the incoming, uh, incoming head. Well, we inaugurated this uh, lecture in 2015. It was part of our 50th anniversary celebrations, really to honor uh, Professor Grigor uh, McClellan. And we stipulated that this lecture uh, should explore the interaction between business and management, education and social responsibility. These were areas that uh, Grigor pioneered throughout his career and which genuinely continue to characterize what EMBS aspires to achieve today. And his view of business and management really has proved to be prescient. Today, more than ever, uh, we require businesses and the leaders of those businesses to understand the social and environmental and business and economic challenges that we face, the, the threats that these challenges pose for old business models, as well as the opportunities that they represent for new ones. And of course, over the past few weeks, if we ever needed to be reminded of this, we absolutely require business leaders to lead through these turbulent times with integrity. A, a Quaker, a businessman, an academic, a government advisor, a philanthropist and author, he was really a polymath, uh, Grigor, and a strong advocate of the principle that business cannot be divorced from society and that managers of those businesses really must be ethical and socially responsible. He was a man with a clear moral compass. He brought compassion and concern, uh, not just for development of, of, of business and growing the economy, but also social justice issues too. And he brought this to all of his undertakings, including his impactful research and inspirational leadership style. So as I said, as incoming head of business school, what a, a, a role model uh, for any leader, let alone any leader of a business school. But Gregor also took an innovative approach to business and management education, which became known as the Manchester Method. Now, a key feature of that uh, was a real emphasis on learning by learning by doing. And that remains also ingrained in AMBS's approach to teaching and learning to this day. As Grigor took up his post, uh, he, he summed up these commitments, these personal values, saying uh, this, I'm committed to the business school being as near as can be expected to the heart of the matter. Through a pioneering spirit which places the school at the frontiers of business and management. Well, this evening, uh, Professor uh, Laura Spence, uh, Professor of Business Ethics at Royal Holloway University of London, will be taking us to the frontiers of business and management with a lecture entitled Taking SMEs Seriously, Social Responsibility for the 99%. So Laura is Professor of Business Ethics at Royal Holloway, University of London, and also at Oxford University. She is International Research Fellow for the Centre of Corporate Reputation and a visiting fellow of uh, Kellogg College. She has published widely in journals which many of the academic uh, members of the audience here will recognize as being uh, 
also journals at the forefront of business and management knowledge, the very best in our field, accounting organizations and society, Journal of Management Studies, Human Relations, Business Ethics Quarterly. And Laura is also consulting editor for the Journal of Business Ethics. Um, something which I uh, is very dear to my heart because I submitted, uh, along with an amazing team, our uh, research excellence framework. We turned Laura, Laura was part of the team that were reading those uh, submissions from all over the UK, selected to sit on the 2021 Research Excellence Framework subpanel for business and management. And more recently, uh, from just last year, 2022, she has been Senior Policy Advisor on Small and Medium Sized Enterprise Engagement for the United Nations Global Compact. So it is a huge welcome, a huge uh, privilege to, to welcome those um, in, in the room. I think uh, we have a larger audience online. We've been impacted just a little bit with the uh, with the uh, teachers strike uh, with a number of people being in touch to say well, we really would love to be there in person but um, due to the to the strike we need to stay at home and watch online we'll be able to gather their questions and um, we're looking forward to, to, to your questions and I'm sure tonight we're going to have a stimulating uh, debate and discussion around about social responsibility for the 99%. Please join me in welcoming uh, Laura to the stage. Uh, thank you. So first of all, thank you for uh, Fiona and Ken for asking me to, to come and give this lecture. It's always, always a pleasure to have the chance to speak to colleagues um, and you know, I'm especially looking forward to um, some feedback from you and questions at the end to try to understand how my work might fit in with your perspectives, because uh, indeed I'm trying to push the boundaries a bit. So let's see how we can uh, take things forward together. So my, my inspiration for my topic tonight, uh, taking SME seriously is, uh, oh dear, that's a shame the picture's just gone. Oh well. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so the inspiration comes from um, the work that I do, which is particularly, though not only, but particularly around small and medium sized enterprises and uh, social responsibility. And I cannot tell you how many times I've sat in a room such as this in a conference um, and uh, added to the conversation by saying, well, this is all very well. The conversation is wonderful. We're talking about social responsibility in in businesses, in corporations, in large firms, actually you're missing out the 99%. You're missing out the majority type of firm, which is small and medium sized enterprises. Every single time the answer comes back, you're absolutely right. Uh, that's a very, very important point. And then the conversation immediately reverts back to large firm perspective. So I haven't encountered much, there it exists, so I haven't encountered much resistance to the idea that small firms are important. But what I've, I've found is a resistance to really taking small and medium sized enterprises seriously in the social responsibility and other, but in the, for our purposes, social responsibility debate. So ever the, the, uh, the uh, kind of ambitious, an enthusiastic person given the opportunity to have 50 minutes with a captive audience. Um, that's what I'm going to try to really bring home. So my hope is that you leave here and if you had any doubts about SMEs or if you were likely to fall into the trap of saying, yes, that's important. And then going back to the same old, same old, um, you know, if I move you just a, a millimeter on the dial, then I'll consider this a success. So um let's crack on and i wanted to oh dear i'm not this this is all very exciting <laughs> okay so i i really really uh it's important to me and i i have a i feel particularly honored to uh be speaking today as part of the grigol mcclelland uh, lecture series not only because um some of the previous speakers are absolutely extraordinary uh, contributors. It's really worth listening to the recordings if you haven't done before. 
Um, but um, you know, as a good student, I did some of the, the work of, of reminding myself about Grigor McClellan's work and Ken's already touched on it. But no, he really started out uh, developing this business school and developing and establishing the Journal of Management Studies, which will get an appearance later on in the talk. Um, tackling the, the issue that was the case and sometimes still is the case that maybe management studies is not a serious subject, not a respectable subject. Um, we, we like to convince ourselves in business schools now that, that we've uh, won that argument, but if you talk to people in other disciplines, it's not always quite so obvious. So, you know, still we need to keep working to make sure management studies is taken seriously. And of course, I've got the, the extra challenge for myself um, around small and medium sized enterprises. And there is still an extra challenge around social responsibility. So, um, you know, I, I like a challenge just as well. Um, otherwise, I'd be backed into a corner rather. But no, I really am on board with Grigor McClellan's um, pioneering work trying to establish management studies as a, a serious subject and important and respectable subject in academia, but also uh, taking seriously the responsibility to bring that excellence in terms of research into practice. So that's what I'm going, I'm setting up myself uh, for a fail here, but that's what I'm trying to do with the talk today is take seriously that uh, ensuring that we have good solid research foundations, but they, we then push ourselves to think about their relevance for um, practice. And I also think it's, it's important that unlike most of us that work in business schools, Grigor McClelland was simultaneously involved in his own family business and took time out from his academic career to work and, and build up the laws um, stores, which was part of the, the family business. Now, I haven't been able to find the data, but my guess is that that might also have been a small and medium sized enterprise. Um, and so, you know, I'm feeling a lot of affinity with Grigor, Grigor McClelland. Let's see how we can take it forward. So this is the kind of broad approach that I'm going to take really initially uh, laying the groundwork for why we might uh, be so concerned or we should be so concerned about small and medium sized enterprises and social responsibility, using theory from uh, my own work with many colleagues to try to establish um, a respectable foundation for that work around small and medium sized enterprises and social responsibility, and then pushing ourselves to think about how that might be helpful for research, education, uh, policy and business practice. So good job that I've got a, a nice stretch of time to do that. Uh, let's um, far away start thinking about that respectability. I would say a small caveat. Um, I'm uh, thinking particularly about small and medium sized enterprises. I have not distinguished much particularly in whether they're um, purpose driven social enterprises, whether they're family businesses, but indeed some of the research draws on those different areas. That might be something that we could get into in the questions to make more of a distinction. But first of all, uh, why this 99, oh gosh, sorry, I'm being over enthusiastic. <laughs> there we go. The claim around 99%. So what I'm not talking about is Occupy Wall Street and the we are the 99%. I'm not even talking about Paul Adler's excellent, by the way, book, The 99% Economy. Um, those are dealing with sort of, if you like, oppressed groups. I'm not particularly arguing that SMEs are an impressed group, in, oppressed group in any way, but I do want to labour the point that we are talking about almost all private enterprises being SMEs. Someone once said to me, you know, if you're if you're showing data which is 100%, there's something wrong. You you needn't needn't sort of ask the question, um, but I am going to ask the question. There's a pie chart which shows the number of enterprises in the UK, this is particularly, I believe, yes, that are small and medium sized, or the, sorry, the proportion of enterprises that are small and medium sized. So it's the green bit, nearly all of them, literally 99.8% of UK enterprises um, are small and medium sized firms. So that means, 
that you know that there's a, a a chunk that are medium-sized firms hardly any are large firms if i think if we were thinking in statistical terms we'd say that large firms are an outlier and that we really shouldn't be thinking about them at all that's pushing the point a little bit for effect i appreciate individually large firms have a have a large impact on their on their um surroundings but really let's really focus on the idea that the normal and the norm in our work could reasonably be small and medium-sized enterprises many people say yes but of course they don't actually employ many people so for the most people that work for a private company in this country most people 64.4 percent will work for a small and medium-sized enterprise so again the lived experience of working in business in this country and every other country by the way is a small firm kind of setting not a large blue chip company which we consistently default to in our business teaching so that could be an error and then of course there's also the financial argument and there is a, a very healthy value added from smes of 52.3 um, percent so again at least collectively that's a, a critically important perspective and of course that's where job growth tends to come from in the economy some people focus on innovation as well in the small firm sector so this is all part of me establishing why we need to take smes seriously oh, endless sorry i need training on clicking there we go uh, <laughs> i'm not going to use that it's all right <laughs> next slide please no i can do it like that so that's all right if yeah that is the oh oh god <laughs> no i don't want that one i want the one with the giant <laughs> back of it back of it yeah the, it's easier with the mouse don't worry i'll do it with the uh that one. Oh, this one's better what am i pressing the top one or the bottom go forward okay thank you <laughs> oh. there we go we have the technology thank you everybody uh, so yes i'm always looking for a, a visual aid uh, just to 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 point out that if we continue to look at large firms as if they were the norm then it's as if we were looking at a giant puppet on the street and thinking that everybody should uh, respond in the same way as that giant puppet. This is in Liverpool, I think, um, and actually overlooking the lived experience of all the people around it who are actually the normal ones. So I think I might be, be getting there in making my point. Just in case anybody's uh, sort of not really got the, the idea of a small firm in their head, I'd invite you to think of a small business so that as we, we go through the conversation, you're referring to that. This is in part my holiday snaps. I am the strange person that goes around taking photos of small businesses when I'm, I'm on a holiday. Um, the, a Japanese cafe or a um, water taxi in uh, Greenland. And then a couple of uh, local examples from around Manchester as well. Um, of course, the people working there, that's their normal working lives. It doesn't matter to them what wonderful codes and standards a large firm that has very little impact on their on their working life has. What matters to them is their experience within their small and medium sized enterprise. And just in case anyone's not up to speed on the definitions, it's it's not a neutral issue definitions definitions around small and medium sized enterprises vary um, in different countries and different contexts but the european union one is still the same as the uk one which is um focuses on employees so there are other measures as well and broadly speaking we're talk about talking about firms with fewer than 250 employees and um, remember that was also a teeny tiny slither of our pie chart so largely, um, we can think about then small and micro sized firms with fewer than 50 and fewer than 10 employees, respectively. And again, the vast majority are 
firms with no employees. So we need to hang on to that idea. So that's the world that we're in for SMEs. And uh, now what's the fuss if we're thinking about social responsibility? And I've added in sustainability parameters. In this talk, I'm going to leave a, a kind of a blurry line between social responsibility and environmental sustainability. That's because a lot of my own work and others crosses over those. Um, you know, that's that's a, maybe controversial. I think there's there's a lot of grounds for arguing we ought to be a little bit more careful and specific about environmental and social issues and how and whether they fit together or are in tension with each other. But just to 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 sort of start to spell out the field, if you like, and, and some of these things will crop up again as we go through the conversation. Um, but with my colleague uh, Meta Morsing and I in a book that was launched yesterday, I think, Corporate Sustainability, we've tried to sort of uh, build up a picture of large multinational enterprises, so, uh, sustainability in that case, um, and against small and medium sized enterprises. And as a teaser, some of these things will come up again in the talk, but just as a teaser, um, there are differences in terms of the motivation for socially responsible practice, whether it's kind of intrinsic, internal to the organization or externally imposed. In terms of communication, this will come up again in a moment, um, whether it's explicit or implicit communication uh, practices around CSR and in fact action around CSR, those of you that know this area will, will pick up that I'm referring to Matten and Moon's work on implicit and explicit CSR. These, the functioning of operations is different, rather transactional in the case of large firms and rather relational in the case of small firms. These are sort of grotesque summaries, but just to, to sort of put the pointers down. And then the formal versus the informal practices um, uh, of organizing within organizations. And finally, there's the scope of stakeholders. I'm going to come on to, to think about stakeholders more particularly in a moment. So that's just to, to sort of uh, throw down some starting points. And in case of any doubt, many years ago, Ruth, Hill, uh, Ruth Holiday um, talked about small firms being different in nature, not just size from their larger counterparts. So, so the, I guess the starting point here is you can't just take what works in a large firm, make it little and then stamp it onto a small firm and hope that it's going to, to function. And that's because of all these differences in the, the, the nature, not just the size of the small firm. So in a sense, this is what I'm going to unfold in the talk today. But I thought it was important to just kind of get real about what's happening with small businesses at the moment. And I, I um, you know, I'm lumping them together. That's also a grotesque error that we can talk about in more detail as if they were one. But let's just think about the UK context. Um, life is really tough for small businesses at the moment. It always is. It's never um, the sunny uplands that I showed in the slide at the, at the beginning of the talk. It's always a case of um, dealing with current issues as, as uh, sort of effectively as you can. But right now, the financial challenges for the small and medium sized enterprise firms is extraordinary. Can you imagine dealing with the energy costs that we're all, you know, kind of weeping quietly as the energy comes in, energy bill comes in each month, realizing the additional costs. Um, try dealing with that when you're a manufacturing business and it's a it's a major proportion of your your monthly outgoings or a small cafe where you can't stop baking bread to save money on energy because that's your core business. Um, the the issues around inflation, the difficulties with supply chains, the not inconsiderable problems uh, built, built in as a result of Brexit and the decline in EU um, export opportunities, um, net zero as an increasing kind of a, a global goal, if you like, but also within the UK context, the expectations around net zero for small businesses are piling up and piling up, and yet they uh, face real uncertainty post-pandemic. They haven't got back on their feet yet post-pandemic, if we are post-pandemic. 
Um, they're struggling with meeting additional costs for standards. Um, I'll talk about the, the additional burden of costs um, in relation to standards and um, reporting for small firms in a moment. And of course, they, you know, they have no experts. They have no expertise. They'll have nobody that did a, a master's course at Manchester University who can deal with all their net zero issues. If they have, they'll be in a very, very lucky position. Um, but nevertheless, they're being asked to keep up with the large firms in terms of uh, commitments to carbon uh, emissions reduction. Um, there are some, some sort of advances, if you like, perhaps for, for all of us, we've got a little bit better at digitization. Um, and that, of course, is also true of small and medium sized firms. But there continue to be structural challenges in terms of opportunities within small businesses and for small businesses. And one of those that I've picked out is the disparity. And while we, you know, in, in many respects, we think we're making progress in terms of um, gender differences and gender opportunities, um, still 16.8% uh, in 2021 of uh, SMEs were women owned compared to over 60% for men owned. So there are still structural barriers and challenges um, that, that are holding back, if you like, SMEs. So I have my sunny uplands at the beginning. It's actually not looking great for the small business economy um, right now in the UK. But ever the optimist, I think uh, there are ways in which we as business school scholars can work to help the situation and to improve the understanding of what will in turn support medium sized enterprises. Um, and I am a, an absolute lover of theory. I think theory should work for us. It should help us to understand the empirically observed world. It should explain what we're seeing. And I'd have to say in um, way back when I started researching around small businesses, I think I, like everybody else, would just keep trying to push large firm um, theory or theory developed with large firms in mind onto small businesses. And again and again, I would kind of be frowning, thinking something's not right here. And so you tinker with it, you add another, another line to your stakeholder theory or whatever it might be. Um, and it was only um, when, uh, if, if you remember the days before the internet being, being relatively uh, freely available, and I was giving a talk at a conference in Elsingor in Denmark, and uh, my computer crashed. And I was there with a beautifully presented uh, presentation, you know, closely referenced and developed stage by stage by stage. And I lost it all the night before the presentation. And so I kind of had to do a, take a different approach and do something speculative. And I'd been playing with, you know, what theory works here. And I'd been thinking more and more about um, the ethic of care, which is something I'll go on to mention. I'm thinking that that's a completely different theory. We haven't really used it in small firm studies. Um, and I think it helps. I think it explains what I've been finding out empirically. And so uh, you know, taking that lesson that actually we might need to think differently to explain small firms and social responsibility. Um, and that's what I've tried to do in building through this work. Some of the, the theory is incremental development but some of it is taking a new stance altogether and seeing what we can shake out and, and improve our understanding. So brace yourselves. This is some heavy theory coming your way and it's just a snapshot. I hope you can follow. I've tried to, to give the references if you want to, to look up in more detail, but I'm gonna ricochet through four different theoretical perspectives. Um, and try to, to convey some of the sort of key moments, if you like, in how I think they, they will help us to understand small business social responsibility. Everyone with me? Yes, good. Here we go. So I did mention already uh, Mitchell, Agel and Wood uh, in 1997 in the Academy of Management Review did an absolute classic article uh, gazillions of uh, citations since then, I think over, over 10,000, if I remember rightly, 
um, citations uh, on this work, which said we have stakeholder theory. I hope that that's familiar to all of you. Um, any organization which has an influence on or is influenced by a firm is a stakeholder to that firm. Lovely, Ed Freeman, uh, even more classic piece of work. And Mitchell Agel and Wood said, actually, that's not helping us to understand the, if you like, the relative importance of stakeholders. So they developed the idea of stakeholder salience and looked at, at issues around power, legitimacy and urgency to try to help us to unpack uh, relative importance, salience of uh, stakeholders of a firm. So the idea, I suppose, is that the definitive stakeholder, the very core stakeholders to an organization is one which has all three kind of boxes ticked of power, legitimacy and urgency. Uh, with, in fact, uh, Ron Mitchell, Brad Agel and uh, Jim Chrisman, uh, looking at this particular, particular one was inspired by four small family firms in, in particular. Uh, we, we argued that actually there's something not quite right when we think about family firm perspectives, because in looking at stakeholder salience, it's taking out of the picture the relational issues which are so important in family firms. So uh, you can imagine if you're sitting at the family uh, dinner table on a Sunday and actually you're sitting with your boss and the HR manager and uh, you know a junior colleague is your child, whatever it might be, there is a different nature to thinking about business practice when it is a wrapped up part of family life as well. Um, some families, I guess, try to keep the two things separate, um, but I think research shows that that's, a, that's a, a, a tricky thing to achieve and actually, and is possibly unhealthy as well, and actually family and business are locked together in the family firm. So what might that mean in terms of uh, stakeholder salience? Well, uh, start at the bottom in terms of urgency. Uh, being a family firm changes the idea and notion around time because family firms are, are likely to always be a little bit caught up with succession issues and thinking about the longer term implications of the work that they do. So immediately we see, well, that's quite interesting, right? So we're not talking about quarterly reporting. We're thinking about future generations of the business. So that, that starts to shift the idea of what urgency uh, implications might be. And then in terms of power, that uh, prestige that is linked with uh, family firms and, and the identity that a family business has in relation to their personal family identity and their business entity is so, so intertwined. You know, imagine that you go into work and it's got your own name above the door. Um, what a difference that makes to your, your feeling um, and your relationship to, the, to that business. So there is something particular about, um, for example, spousal relationships. There is something about the roles within the family. Um, so still there is a tendency for, I think it's called primogeniture, that the, the male, the eldest male is most likely to go into the family business. That varies in different countries um, and it's not always the case but it happens and it happens often. So you know, what, what's going on there? How do we understand the power issues at play there? And then the, the first category um, around legitimacy, I think is especially important for family and small firms around the legacy of the business. So if you sp speak to small, small businesses, some, not all, are really thinking about the, the legacy that they leave behind for the work that they do. Um, even if it's not a family firm, they're really concerned about their, their sort of own status that, and how that's wrapped up into the firm and how their business might be remembered in the future. If you put your heart and soul into a business, how it's, how it's remembered um, in years to come is especially important. So there are some shifts there, and that would be an example of incremental change to an existing theory to try to make it amenable to including family and small businesses. 
Uh, the next example that I want to use is in the Journal of Management Studies. So thank you very much, Gregor McClelland, for introducing the Journal of Management Studies to us and to them for, for publishing this work with um, Christopher Vickett and Andrea Scherer. Um, and in this paper, we were building on previous work uh, with Doro Bauman as well in the Journal of Business Ethics, in which I'd, we'd identified a real difference between small and large firms in terms of, of two aspects of CSR. And that's something that we, we tend to lump corporate social responsibility together. We were trying to tease it out a little bit here in just simple two different ways. First of all, thinking about corporate social responsible, responsibility in terms of communication. So those of you that are in the area will know that there is a whole stream of research around CSR communication. So that might be um, reporting, advertising, it might be, be uh, labels that you use on your products to, to sort of try to convey some element of your social responsibility. So that communication side um, on the one hand and the implementation side on the other. So what is actually making a difference within the firm in terms of changes made in the systems, the structures, um, the uh, reward systems perhaps that you might have in the organization. So that implementation of social responsibility. And those can be quite different things. And we detected from some empirical work in Switzerland, some different approaches according to large and small organizations, such that on the one hand, large firms seem to be pretty well equi equipped in communicating their social responsibilities. And if you know of firms and their social responsibility departments or sustainability or whatever they call it, very often a great chunk of their time is taken up with reporting, not actually with implementing social responsibility in the business, but creating not quite a glossy document anymore. It's more likely to be digital and online, but that's the focus of their day-to-day -day activity. Um, and as a result, large firms, which I remember report regularly about all sorts of things, very concerned with their external uh, facing information, now are well equipped to do a great job of reporting on CSR and the costs of that. And cost is something that we brought into the story. So the um, uh, vertical axis here is relative cost of CSR. That demonstrates that um, the cost is relatively low for large firms to report well, if you like, on their corporate social responsibility. For small firms, the reverse is true. To, to you know, imagine you're a, a, um, a butcher shop down the road here, perhaps, or is it Pizza Co? Uh, you know, just a small cafe, a small restaurant. The, the disproportionate cost that it would be for them to stop what they're doing which is probably not making a massive profit in the first place, but to take time out of that and to say, what we're gonna do is do a, concentrate on our CSR reporting. It's extraordinary, but it would be wildly excessive for uh, you know, a very small business to invest the, the little time that they have into creating some sort of CSR report, even if it's a small one, a relatively small one. Remember many businesses don't have a website, let alone have a section on a website that talks about social responsibility. So any, any investment in, in reporting CSR is likely to be quite significant for the large firm, relative, uh, for the small firm, relatively expensive. So what we find here is they, uh, there is a, a small firm communications gap for social responsibility. And you will have guessed that the reverse is true for implementation. So if a small business owner says, well, what we're going to do is really change how we think about social responsibility, or they probably wouldn't use that language, why would they? But they might say, actually, I need to make sure you're all getting a living minimum wage, not just a minimum wage, I kind of hear living costs are going up, let's make sure you're all paid properly. Um, that would be a socially responsible thing to do. And it can be done almost like that, you know, an immediate communication. And that's perhaps a, a, a overly simplistic way of doing it. But the barriers to implementing social responsibility within the firm are very low for a small firm compared to all the glorious bureaucracies, systems, structure, 
individual roles, people that you have to convince, uh, committees that you have to get on side to change something within a large firm. So in large firms, the implementation gap for social responsibility is, is large, is high. So in this paper, what we did really was by focusing on, focusing on cost rather than profit and trying to differentiate two very simple, um, broad approaches to CSR implementation and reporting. We showed a, a difference for large and small firms. Still with me? Hopefully that's making, making sense. Uh, so the next one, well, we're halfway there on the theory. This is where uh, my little story about Denmark and uh, computers crashing really developed into a paper from 2016, I think it was, in Business and Society, in which I, I made that argument more, more systematically that what we were observing in small businesses, and I've sort of hinted at, at different types of approaches to social responsibility, couldn't really be explained by traditional theory and that we might look somewhere else to explain it. Now, the ethics of care is a theory that comes out of um, feminist perspectives on ethics and Carol Gilligan's work in a different voice from the 1980s, in which she identifies if we include women as well as men in our conversations and analysis of moral development of children, actually, and, and young people, we hear something different. It's not saying you hear one thing from men and one thing from women, but if you include um, both genders and previous work, work and research had not included both genders, it just been done on men, then you hear different things. You hear different voice about what is ethical and what is moral practice. And from that, people like Virginia Held have developed her work into an idea of an ethic of care. And I really recommend it to you uh, because it, it looks at things in a different way, but in, what, in a way which really is quite easy to tune into and think, yes, that's what we see in different, different parts of the uh, society that we live in. So I've, I've sort of distilled some different aspects of the ethics of care here, um, meeting the needs of others for whom we have a responsibility, valuing emotions, accepting that there is partiality. So, so all the Theories of ethics, most of the theories of ethics um, suggest a kind of rational economic person at the core of it who's making rational decisions, who puts family allegiances, perhaps even friendships to one side. And the ethics of care says actually we need to acknowledge that individuals have a partiality, that we, we prioritize the needs of some people. Family would be the, the most obvious one over others. Um, and importantly, the ethic of care says we need to get away from the idea that we can separate our public selves and our public practices, by which we mean the things we do in public settings uh, such as this, in government, in business, um, in institutions, from our private selves and our family and private lives. And that might include um, education, nurseries, the home, of course, it might include health care elder care, those kinds of things. And I think it, it, was, it was ever thus that actually those things uh, cross over and, and interfere, if you like, with each other in a good way. Um, but the pandemic, of course, blew apart any idea that we can separate our private and our public lives as, as each of us was looking into each other's homes during a, a, week, a work meeting, even yesterday, I was talking to a colleague who had her toddler on her lap due to, to health reasons. So I think if, if we didn't spot it before, we really should be understanding now that there, that any um, idea that there is a clear separation is a false one. And we bring our private selves to work and we bring our public selves home. So much better to acknowledge that and try to attend to it. Um, so... I, you'll have got the idea that I think looking at the world of small businesses from an ethic of care perspective really helps us to explain what we observe. That informality that I mentioned about how businesses are organized, the idea that certain uh, stakeholders will be prioritized and will have a, a closer relationship, if you like, to the firm. 
Um, the, the acknowledgement that, for example, the owner manager of a firm, um, and this is big in the small business literature, of course, will, it will most likely promote members of the family over those that are not members of the family. It's an ongoing problem in small business life. Um, and that informal and relational perspective and the, the relatively flat hierarchy and the uh, acknowledgement, you know, the fact that owner managers will often know details they maybe even shouldn't about their individuals' lives um, of the people that are working for them. And the in interdependence of people working in and around the firm, even suppliers, even competitors. I did a, a small paper which talked about SME competitors as moral stakeholders of the firm, because especially in local areas, people will work together with their competitors in order to fill, for example, an order that they can't quite complete. They'll, they'll pass it on to, to a sort of a friend and competitor. So last theory, um, as time is ticking by, and this is, a, this is a, a bit of a mind twister. It builds on the work of Michel Foucault, um, this is, is a sort of step back to the implicit and explicit CSR area that I was talking about earlier and just establishing and confirming the claim uh, with my colleague Meta Morsing about uh, CSR or social responsibility in small firms being in more implicit and social responsibility in large firms being more explicit. explicit. Um, and from that, um, you know, I hope everyone's sitting down. We developed this beautiful model, I couldn't be more proud of it, um, in which we argued uh, using Foucauldian theory, Michel Foucault, so you know it's not, not an easy access one, this one. We argued that the pressures on small firms to respond, particularly supplier firms, SME suppliers, to respond to large firms' ideas of what they ought to do in terms of social responsibility which bearing in mind are most likely to be some kind of reporting, which as we've said, they're not well equipped to do, um, actually could have you know, really important, not always positive effects. You know, uh, almost certainly someone will, at the end of this will say, but of course, large, large firms are really great at encouraging small firms to be social resp socially responsible by setting demands on them. That is one argument. The other one is, that by doing that, they effectively take away the agency of the smaller firm to be socially responsible in their own right. And Meda and I really focused on the challenge to small firms in terms of their authenticity, their identity and their values, if they are pushed to conform to ideas of social responsibility that large firm customers required of them, which let's face it, are designed to suit the large firm's need not the small firm's needs. So Denise Barden and colleagues have said that this might actually have a deleterious effect on social responsibility of small firms. It's certainly something we need to be aware of, you know, the different pressures and how they, you know, flow through to small business perspectives. So back in a sense to our kind of sunny uplands, um, I made the point that I, you know, I really appreciate good theory and good research, but I also want it where possible to do some work for us. And I think there is nothing wrong with championing the practical perspective of good theory. I'm not the, not the first to notice it. So here I want to get on to the idea of theory being helpful um, and uh, you know, nurturing the world around us and see what we can do to pull uh, out some of the idea, ideas. So just quickly thinking about um, research and these are strands from all the things I've been saying, but um, I think I'm sure I let my own personal perspectives come in that we need to be pushing beyond the usual suspects in thinking about research, be ready to tackle taboo subjects. Um, remember being in a conference talking about gun control, for example, and the conversation, guess what, was in America, and it was about whether or not guns should have um, surfaces which would not show fingerprints. From a British European perspective, that's kind of <laughs> a, a challenge to really get into a conversation about that detail and, and not to challenge the existence of, of those that um, opportunity to have that kind of business for the public anyway. 
Um, so I know I won't dwell on this. I think I've touched on a lot of things, but our research uh, infrastructure, um, we might also think about how that relates to some of these uh, social responsibility issues. Having been on the REF sub panel, it is possible, of course, to play the academic games through publishing social responsibility. But if our work is to be really practice orientated as well, it doesn't always fit quite so easily and obviously into those academic journals, perhaps if only because we're using different theories to explain. So we're not fitting some standard molds. Um, just thinking about education, of course, the particularly the United Nations principles of responsible management education um, are doing great work here in, in conveying and supporting uh, small uh, social responsibility, education and responsible management. Um, we might think, where are their gaps still? Should we be pushing beyond universities? I'm certain that we are. Schools aren't doing a bad job. I go and speak on the A-level religious studies course at my local comprehensive school about business ethics every year, um, you know, and that's part of their syllabus. So there are there are sort of uh, gleams of light out there, but you no, know, who's training the teachers to think about social responsibility? Who's training the professional services? Um, what is our responsibility as business schools? I think Grigor McClelland has, has set a good example for us there. And what are we doing to make sure that we vary the units of analysis that we use, not least SMEs, but also thinking about uh, cities or rural areas or different communities and different regional approaches. Um, and I can't help uh, linking all of this to the sustainable development goals, not flawless, of course, um, but you know, so much of value in there that, that we could use to try to bolster some of these perspectives, and many business schools certainly are. And then in terms of practice, all that I've said should also be of interest to large firms. If, oh look, there's me saying I've run out of time. I might run out of time. <laughs> um, we're nearly there. Um, you know, really just uh, encouraging large firms and those that are interested in social responsibility to be ready to listen to the perspectives of those they work with and small firm points of view and to engage rather than uh, try to press their own, own perspective on, on social responsibility. And then small firms, uh, this is from the um, uh, some piece of research which, which argues that there is, if you like, a business case for small firms. That's not my argument. I think there are there are other things that we might be looking at as well as the business case. Um, and I think indeed from the point of view of the, the four theoretical pointers that I've identified, um, you know, to, this is all, it's reiteration really, but we can learn from what actually will work for small businesses in terms of supporting their social responsibility. I'm gonna skip that. Just to say politics is not, neutral in this. So these are the um, voting records of UK parliamentarians and the, the colours represent the political parties and it's particularly around climate, this, this um, perspective. But it is not a, a neutral thing which governments are in power, which political parties are power and their particular agendas. So we shouldn't pretend that it is, in my view. We need to be engaging with that. And of course, if theory, if policy wants to support small firms, then they also need to attend to some of the, the issues that I've identified. And then finally, um, I want to remind you, and I think I might have this um, on my tombstone, really. If we are to um, understand social responsibility, we have to also understand small and medium-sized enterprises. And my argument is if we don't, then we have made very little progress in understanding the role of business in society. And we shouldn't still be looking at the feet of the giant. We ought to be thinking also about the smaller organizations um, around it. Um, I think that will do. Yeah. I wanted to, to end on... Um, more wise words from Grigor McClelland, um, identifying that we, we need to be concerned with society as well as the individual, with social change as well as social service, 
with reform as well as relief. And I think that the next part, point of departure for us is to, to think, um, you know, we are confronted with existential problems. It just might be that even trying to be a little more radical in our approach is not enough and that we need some existential solutions. That will do, I think. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Laura, uh, for, for um, navigating the technology and navigating the field and taking us through uh, such um, an interesting and important uh, topic. I'd like to invite our panelists. We're going to uh, have um, the opportunity for us to explore some of these questions with uh, Laura and uh, two other uh, colleagues, one from the business school and uh, one from uh, Manchester and Australia. Just let me tell you a little bit about our um, panelists. Uh, Arthi, Arthi uh, uh, Krishnan is a senior lecturer in sustainability and innovation here uh, with us at the University of Manchester. Now, Arthi is going to bring a particular perspective as uh, a developmental economist working at the nexus of uh, environment, trade and development. Very many of the issues that Laura's brought to our attention are of course amplified um, down supply chains across developing and developed uh, contexts. Arthi's particular area of interest is around about uh, value chain analysis, green growth, and regional development. And prior to joining us here, she um, was a senior research officer at the Overseas Development Institute. So welcome, Arthur. Julia, Julia Rouse. Um, so many really interesting aspects on, on Julia's uh, bio. Just pick out a few, uh, a few of them relevant for a uh, discussion uh, this evening. Uh, Julia founded the Centre for Decent Work and Productivity in the Sylvia Pankhurst Gender and Diversity Research Centre at Manchester Mil Metropolitan uh, University. Very much engaged in developing methodology, uh, which chimes with um, rigorous interest around about engaged activist scholarship and how that's applied to shaping good work in self-employment and entrepreneurial uh, context. The list could go on and on. Just let me pick out a couple of, um, of other highlights. Working during the COVID uh, crisis, researching and campaigning for better policy for the self-employed uh, and um, working with maternity management also in small firms and again, applying it to self employ um, new venture creation. So fascinating perspective um, from Julia. Now our discussion, our panel discussion is going to be chaired by Hong Wei. Hong Wei is um, Professor of Marketing and School Social Responsibility Director. Again, a uh, hugely impressive CV covering uh, important editorial positions with um, journals such as the Journal of Business Research and uh, responsible for tracks such as business ethics, CSR and strategic management. We could go on and on and on, but we really want to hear uh, our colleagues' perspective and give you the opportunity to ask some questions. So, Hong Wei, over to you. Thank you, Cam. Thank you so much, Rola, for this amazing talk. I remember at the beginning, you said you would be happy if we would move our feet one millimeter uh, by listening to your talk. Uh, I hope I can delight you by saying that I've moved probably much more than one millimeter. I don't even know how to count. And then I, I hope that would make me uh, uh, belong to the 99% of the audience. So I had at least 99% of us would have moved more than uh, 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 one millimeter. Uh, so that's a, a very fascinating, amazing talk. Uh, I think I have a few questions to ask you, but before that, I think I would give to the 
the other two panel members to talk about uh, your perspective on SME's social responsibility. Yeah, so shall we have uh, Julia, do you want to go first? Well, I've got a vested interest because I did my PhD in the same <laughs> centre that Laura did her postdoc. Yeah. So we go back a long way. We do, we do. <laughs> and uh, we both had, uh, sustained an odd obsession with small firms. Mm. Um, I grew up in a small firm and I was involuntarily self-employed, probably falsely self-employed in the early 90s recession, as many of our graduates may have become falsely self-employed mm. in, uh, in, in the years uh, following graduation in, uh, in current days. And um, so I, 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 I've been asked to say provocative things, so okay. I'm going to be provocative. Um, Go for it. Yeah. <laughs> so I all, I'm always wondering whether we've got whether we've got the right unit of analysis. Mm -hmm. And I heard an interesting statistic the other day that more than half of the entrepreneurs in the UK have a job. Now, if we think about their absorptive capacity to learn about. I don't know, green issues, for example, mm. that sort of changes my mindset when I think about influencing them a little bit. And we think about periods of entrepreneuring in people's lives, particularly when we think about mm. those without employment, that em employees are self-employed, essentially. Mm. Um, the sort of flowing in and out of enterprise, it's not this sort of static thing, is it? Often yeah. it's this yeah. churn. There's a, there's a combination of an established set of businesses and a big load of churn as well. Um, and also that's complicated, really complicated in policy terms, isn't it? In terms of who mm. is your captive audience, how do you capture them, et cetera. When I think about good work and I think about small firms and, and all the things that you said, and you know, we think about resource constraints, informality, the socially responsible thing of making the business survive on a day-to-day -day basis, which is, mm the bread and butter business of um, very small firms. And I think about the really tricky issue of how you get small firms to learn and change. We know that they've got really vulnerable compliance uh, with regulations and a, a somewhat mistrust of regulations. In, in employment regulations ought to be useful shorthand ways to resolve ethical dilemmas for practice, shouldn't they? They should be useful, actually. But the, we have a rhetoric of red tape, reducing red tape mm. to make the world country the best place in the world to grow and start and grow a business. That's what the government's been saying in successive governments, which I think really doesn't help in helping them think about regulations as useful. <laughs> um, but I suppose we've been involved in some projects recently where we put large firms with small firms. So we break this convention. You've got large firms over here and small firms and ne never the twain shall meet. That the practices of, the, of each other won't work. And in Manchester, we have the Good Employment Charter where we're trying to put small firms and big firms together and with an idea that they might learn from one another. And when I, I, I'm running a project on promoting ethnic minority leadership in the social housing sector in Manchester and I've just run a project on developing the people management skills um, of line managers and we've put small firms and big firms together and it's interesting that you're right they have completely different contexts but sometimes they can have enough emotional intelligence or if you like mm. to be able to say for example we were teaching people management at the moment of coming back after the pandemic and they were saying to the large firms can I have a look at your flexible working policy please they might not have imported mm. it full scale but it was, they didn't have exposure to it at all otherwise, and they could pick a mix mm. from those resources. I'm putting, they put in large firm resources in front of small firms in environments where they're willing to have a look because they've developed the relationship. And, and in, in the project in the social housing sector, because they're all partners, some of them are tiny, some of them are huge. Some of the large firms are learning from the informality of the small firm. For example, around recruitment, making recruitment less formal to make it more equal, actually, and experimenting with that and vice versa. So I don't know. So my mm. question to you, if I'm here to ask a question, is about whether or not you think small firms and large firms should always be kept separately. If we want to influence them, you know, is this idea of small firm support. Right. Mm. 
is is my question. Yeah. Do you want me to respond to that now or to come, come back to yeah. it? So first, of, thank you for taking my law. <laughs> <laughs> so I can. Yeah, exactly. I'll probably overstep so, yeah, my yeah, role. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, I think uh, probably let's uh, you you can respond yeah. probably a little bit later. Let's uh, okay. let's uh, allow Arti to 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 uh, express your opinion first. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And then we. Yeah. Thank you so much. That was very thought provoking. And I think my question is to link in with what you've talked about. So in part, I want to sort of give a comment and then have many questions within that. <laughs> but they're all thought provoking questions, hopefully. And I wanted to tag on to what you talked about authenticity. Because mm -hmm. the big question then is saying sustainability or social responsibility for who? Right? Because a lot of these SMEs are part of these bigger and broader value chains or supply chains, right? And so, as you were saying that these large multinational corporations have their own responsibility agendas, their own sustainability agendas, that often trickle down this value chain to these specific uh, SME firms who are often subcontractors or suppliers. So, um, for instance, a lot of my research looks at um, Kenya and UK value chains. And I look at a lot of agro-processing SMEs, for example, those who make juice, or those who are packaging the avocados you buy in Tesco. About 80% of Kenya's avocados come to the UK. And so effectively what happens is that they experience what we call a sustainability social responsibility squeeze, isn't it? Where they have to comply with these requirements in order to continue to participate in these value chains. So de facto, they don't have any autonomy themselves mm. to create their own sustainability agendas. Otherwise, they no longer can participate in these chains. And what's interesting is if Tesco has a priority saying, oh, part of our responsibility is let's pay fairer wages or let's improve biodiversity. Now, they're not going to just give a heap of money to an SME. They trickle it down the chain and they say, you as an SME, you do this. So if an SME, for instance, decides let's pay higher wages, the trade-off then is the working conditions get worse because people are working longer hours for the SME. If they, for instance, in Kenya, in my research, I find one of the core requirements by companies, large supermarkets in the UK was, let's improve biodiversity. Well, the key issues in Kenya are soil being destroyed because of a lot of cropping and also water issues. But the funds are now moving towards improving biodiversity. What happens to the livelihood of farmers who are selling to them? So there are these trade-offs, like you mentioned, mm. between these sort of economic, social, and within social and within environmental as well. And this often creates these sort of negative externalities that come about it. So my big question then is saying, right, this is now further deepened when we think about SMEs in the global south. Right, the ones who have to participate. So my question is, um, when what are the effects do you see when you have these top-down supplier squeezes on sort of socioeconomic, environmental growth of these SMEs in these places? And is there a way to create a sort of more equitable redistribution of that value that the SMEs have now sort of given to these larger firms in some way? And how? Can that be regulated? What can be done about something like that more broadly? Mm, thank you. Thank Shall you. I take those together? Yeah, sure. Before sure. I faint. <laughs> 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 no, brilliant, brilliant points. Thank you. And you know, really, really on the on the money, really. Um, I think uh, we have to um, acknowledge that there are supply chain relationships, large firms, small firm relationships. I'm not trying to pretend that there aren't, they exist there part of the, the lived experience for small businesses. In one paper with uh, Michael Bolakis, we, we tried to propose the idea of supply chain responsibility. Um, that was a, a kind of evolution from uh, an understanding of the focal point of a supply chain, of a, of a value chain, being a kind of corporate social watchdog for the whole chain. And that's what I'm trying to guard against, is the idea that the, um, the large firm, the focal firm of a supply chain has some kind of moral monopoly on correct practice for others that it works with. 
So where a large firm and a small firm are honestly and openly working together, brilliant. That's exactly what we were advocating for in, in supply chain responsibility. But that, that's quite impressive and unusual that a large firm would stop and listen to a small firm perspectives. Partly it's a numbers game. They may have tens of thousands of suppliers. And so that trickle down effect um, it might reach the first tier, whether it reaches the second yeah. tier is a is a very big question mark. Okay. Um, so I'm in, I'm not sort of, I don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater. You know where where there is genuine engagement mm. and the possibility of reciprocity and shared learning, mm. then then there's real hope. Okay. Um, but but my my point is we should be first thinking about the small firms, not first and and only thinking about the large firms. Okay. Thank you. That's a good point. Yes, thank you. Uh, yes, uh, I've been really learning a lot from your presentation, particularly two aspects or two theories. The first one is about ethics of care that you think are particularly relevant uh, for the small business. And also the other one is about the uh, uh, implementation versus communication. Mm -hmm. uh, this seems to be a, a two elements. It seems like you try to so more questions. I try to merge that into one question so that we have more time for the audience. Um, I want you to, I, I just wonder when I look at this uh, implementation versus communication issue, it seems to me that it, the current conceptualization is like that different. All right. But I, I, I can't help to wonder actually and try to reflect on my own kind of uh, mm -hmm. managerial role. It seems implementation and communication might not be as clear cutly separated as you like, as you would have conceptually in your paper. Because in practice, actually, a lot of implementation is a communication. And <laughs> so, 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 in that sense, I just wonder to some extent, and I, probably this is also reflected by your the other paper on implicit communication mm -hmm. versus explicit communication. It looks like a lot of uh, implicit communication actually is more or less like a implementation. So I just wonder, do you have any kind of comments on how these two can work together rather than they are pulling each other apart? Rather than, so do you have anything yeah. to say on that? There, okay. I think in the uh, the paper with the exciting diagram um, on governmentality, we try to to tackle that issue look, using um, communication constitutes organization theory from the CSR communication yeah. literature. I didn't want to bring in yet another theoretical perspective, but that that is really worth reading up on and, and looking at because they make exactly that argument that by uh, by developing our communications, we influence the organizational practice. And what uh, Meda and I kind of ended up with in, in our paper um, in human relations was was saying we don't think that things are necessarily the same in small and medium-sized enterprises. We challenge the idea of CCO uh, communication constituting organization in in smaller organizations and and uh, we kind of mute at the end of it the the perspective of silent communication as being something that we might want to look at more and understand more in small firms because it's about the lived experience of of being the business, living their values, if you like, um, that, that perhaps holds the key to social responsibility in, in especially the smallest firms. Um, so, so yeah, there's a, the, those two, they are linked. And the, the idea of the CSR walk and CSR talk is quite a, quite a developed um, area of, of the CSR communication literature. Yeah. Um, we're, we're questioning, poking and prodding at the idea of, of how that translates and whether it translates to small firms. Very quickly, a comment about your comment about uh, ethics of care is, I would imagine probably you can see that's uh, happening in small business. I began to wonder whether that's uh, your theory is a very normative one or it's a very descriptive one in a sense. If it is a normative one, I think it's fine. Let's, uh, let's promote it. Or you, it's a describe, descriptive one so that actually that's exactly what we are observe, observing in the world. That's really happening. So which which it's mm. more towards normative or more towards a descriptive I, at this I, stage. Yeah, at this stage. I think it started out as um, descriptive, as hang on, I'm observing this. Here's a theory which which matches it and can be 
be brought to help our understanding of what we're observing. Um, but I think, um, as with all theories, they're not discreetly descriptive or normative, yeah. um, but actually we're kind of moving towards the idea of, of promoting and encouraging um, and saying this, this is actually how it ought to be. We ought to acknowledge our private selves in the public sphere and vice versa. We ought to account for them and attend to them um, and, and deal with the challenges and the potential tensions, but also look for, for you know, where things work well together. So the, the fact that we are all um, much more comfortable with working at home, as long as it's properly resourced and supported, you know, that for me is an acknowledgement of bringing the private and the public together. The fact that colleagues can't come in because they're looking after their children because the, the teachers are striking, and that that's an accepted part, and they can look online and they can watch the streaming. That for me is breaking down some of those barriers, and and I think that's a good thing. Okay. So yes, normative. Thank you. So now let, let let's uh, open the open it to the floor. Do we have any questions or comments? Yeah. Thank you. Um, I'm Beth Sharrett. I work for GMCBO. We're a charity working across Greater Manchester um, uh, to drive um, social and economic inclusion. Um, my question is actually about social responsibility in the context of public procurements. So, as, as you'll know, assessing sort of potential um, social value is, is part of a contract award process. And what we know from our own experiences and that of voluntary and community and social enterprise organisations we, we talk to is that the measurement systems and process and um, what's actually formed part of, of, of that process is kind of skewed towards larger corporates and doesn't capture effectively some of the day-to-day um, -day kind of social value that, that is, you know, is the reason a lot of that sector exists. So that was something, a kind of observation of how there's real synergies between the voluntary sector and small and medium enterprise. And, and I think that the more kind of local and neighbourhood you, you go, um, the more you can draw parallels between the two. So yeah, my mine was less of a question and more of an observation, but whether you had any reflections of that and you felt like it it chimed with your experience. Yes. <laughs> no, absolutely. There's a there's a piece of work that needs to be done about uh, small firms, voluntary organizations, charities, hybrid organizations. Um, you know, across the board and, and really trying to, and family businesses as well, I'd put in, in there too. Um, you know, these things aren't discrete. There's, there's a great deal of crossover. And, and yeah, like I said, I've sort of bundled things together. Um, now I would really love to see closer work, really distinguishing differences and similarities. Thank you. Uh, Mark Hughes, I'm a chief executive of the growth company, which is a, a social enterprise, but from a scale point, I think it'll be fitting your 0.2%. Uh, I was actually almost going to pick up exactly the same uh, point colleague over there, and I think you've kind of answered it and said that I look forward to more research. Mm -hmm. I think there's a real perversion in public sector procurement taking place at this moment in time, um, where it effectively it, social value has now become a point bidding score exercise rather than looking at what the purpose of the organization is about and what it's achieving holistically. And it is, it is now just a, um, a gaming uh, activity uh, within that. And, and therefore, I think a real interesting area for research would be to look at how public procurement has been um, hijacked, might be uh, the right term. Um, and its original purpose has been taken off track um, in terms of uh, social value. Um, and I think that that's occurring at both local and, and national level. Um, and so it's not just private companies that might be affecting small SMEs in the way you described. I think it's actually public sector uh, that's doing it as well. And so uh, a huge area for investigation. Mm. Can I respond? Yeah. I can't help but respond from a personal experience. So. I had a PhD student who looked at this, Mark, and um, they actually looked at how small firms become capable of tendering public sector contracts. And we launched from that a spin-out business called the Centre for Tendering, where we've come up with a model called, which is called REACH, which is about how to make procurers become uh, inclusive procurers. And there's a load of practical things that can be done to make procurement more accessible to small firms and also 
clever tendering where we we teach firms how to tender including how to express their social value and then of course that bridge in between and i'm not just set here to plug although i am partly <laughs> but um i th i i i i just think that i'm absolutely convinced that nothing will change until there is a regulatory pressure on procurers to change mm. having been out there and talked spoken to a lot of procurers i think that we have to have a regulatory pressure to make it happen. Mm. Uh, Tony Johnson, I'm a Chartered Secretary and a Chartered Banker, long since retired. Uh, I do feel that um, there, is, there should be legal protection in, and in relation to cases that um, are based really on or have an element of um, morality in, in them. Um, and clearly uh, banks and large institutions and government institutions tend to bend the rules and hide things. Um, and I, I did tell that you know, in my involvement in uh, some years ago in uh, the case of Lloyds taking over HBOS, which was just really hiding the, the, the dispensation was given to disclose uh, facts, material facts, and uh, we lost uh, the case of them spending 30 million on it. Um, and then Lloyds came back seeking 30 million to meet their expenses. But uh, I also, you know, if I could quickly mention um, some years ago um, when a Rhodesia had went for UDI uh, and there was an embargo on trade, uh, oil and, you know, anything. Um, but uh, Gordon, uh, no, it was, um, it was Harold Wilson and uh, uh, Shirley Williams, Shirley Williams, the Commonwealth Secretary, uh, they gave um, dispensation, uh, although it was against the law, to allow oil imports, but uh, they went for all the SMEs, uh, which were actually trading illegally. Uh, so there is a general issue in relation to, to the protection of individuals and for the disclosure. And there's been less openness in society, as far as I'm concerned, in recent years, certainly people pay gospel to the ethics, but underneath there is, they, they actually, you know, there's no change. Nothing to add to it, sir. <laughs> well said. Hello, uh, thanks for the talk. I really enjoyed it. I'm the founder of an early stage startup and a lot of that really resonated with me. Um, and for that reason, I'm interested in uh, businesses that are growing very quickly. And I just wondered whether there'd been much work on the transition from being a small business and taking these things into account. Because, you know, right now I do feel like I don't have the capacity, but, um, you know, it's something we deeply care about. And there's, most of what we do now is implicit. And is there a recommendation or an ideal path for that journey? Mm. I don't, I, don't, I don't think there's an ideal path that, you know, we, we're, we're bound to sort of uh, want to understand the particular circumstances and the contextual circumstances. But in terms of, of the growth thing, I think there's another piece of work around tipping points. Um, but in general, medium firms have been found in the past by my colleagues that have done work on this to, to really sort of mimic large firm practices. Um, and, you know, we, we probably uh, shouldn't be lumping SMEs together. We might be thinking about smaller micro firms more specifically um, and leaving, talking more about medium and large firms as, as having those uh, formal structures in place. Um, so um, I haven't got a beautiful answer for you, unfortunately. Perhaps you'd let us know. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Yep quite a lot online so I'm just going to do one of those and um, we've got one here is religion which influences many SME owner managers around the world relevant to further explore the small business social responsibility perspective in diverse contexts do you want another one as well and then you can have a think about both and um, we've got another one here do we see any distinction between SMEs that are born responsible versus those that are, are pursuing responsibility in for example communications or behaviors 
board responsible. The, the religion one, there is actually quite a lot of work and a number of my PhD students have done work specifically on what we might call religious SME owner managers. Um, Andrea Werner's looked at, at Christian owner managers in uh, Germany and uh, the UK and uh, Selçuk Oger has looked at um, Turkish uh, small businesses and those which have a commitment to um, their Islamic religion and those that are, are less committed in their daily practice and talks about the moral energy of the religious perspective that they uh, work with and operate with. So there is there is work um, looking at different religious perspectives. Um, it has an influence. It's a social structure. It informs people's decision making. Um, but yeah, I, I wouldn't personally want to only look at religious perspectives. I think there are many, many more um, influences on on what creates a small business. Um, the, the born born small businesses versus created. I, yeah, I'd like to understand what was meant by being born social responsibility, socially responsible. I think none of us are perfect. There is no business, there's no person that is, is you know, a, an ideal, pure uh, sort of approach to, to business. We're all dealing with contextual challenges and, and finding our way through them. So, I, yeah, I'd like to understand more behind the question, I think. I don't know. Yeah, please. Yeah, please. Yeah. Can I add a little oh, bit please. to the born responsibility? Because, I mean, there's so much of literature around you know, born digital, born. So uh -huh. it's sort of thinking about if you were born, say, as a very specific kind of social enterprise, if you were born with thinking about very social values. I mean, there are questions behind this, like you were talking about a lot of the theory we have are rational, mm -hmm. right? So as soon as you start thinking about, well, these aren't working in that rational economic order because they're putting social values as more important, mm -hmm. then maybe we need to think about it in a more bounded context. But again, the problem is, is if they want to be part of these broader supply chains, how long can you stay born responsible to the values that you hold true mm -hmm. versus then just creating a situation that's more of a, okay, I'm satisfied with this, though I'm not happy because it makes everybody else, you know, in a more equilibrium position within this whole space. And I think that's always a tussle between companies that are trying to like retrofit responsibility into their operations where you can pick and choose what you want to do based on if you're already part of a bigger network mm. versus maybe if you're born into it then you have to fit yourself into something that already maybe exists so it might be harder that way mm. yeah i i don't want to i don't want to keep you until midnight <laughs> so i so we have time for probably one final question yes and we can keep going. Hi, thank you. Um, my name is Rachel Shaw. Uh, I feel like I've, I was nodding along to everything that you're saying because I felt like I kind of was coming from having worked at the co-op for the last four years in a large corporate, having done an MBA and now joining an SME business uh, in Manchester. I feel like there was a lot of kind of parallels and kind of contrast going through my mind. And I think in the spirit of sort of maybe being a bit kind of controversial and kind of bringing a bit of healthy debate and, and discussion, I think you made an interesting comment about are SMEs oppressed or are they an oppressed group if we are the 99% the majority? And I think there's a lot of interesting conversation emerging now where PLCs are being, you know, they've got standards and reporting that is being mandated that's not currently applied to SMEs. Therefore, there's a potential that some agency is going to be taken away. And I think a lot of SMEs are feeling apprehensive where they're going to be expected to then suddenly find some middle ground of the levels of kind of reporting that's expected of SMEs. So, I feel like I was just interested maybe to sort of pick a bit more on that, that, that power dynamic and you know oppression, marginalization, thinking about you know diversity and equity inclusion is very much part of sustainability and CSR. And then there's a lot of marginalized groups who are also then becoming business leaders because they are struggling to get into other organizations. So I'm really interested to maybe just hear some reflections from the group around kind of expanding on those power dynamics and how they're evolving in the marketplace that we're in. Uh, and what that might look like for the work in the future of directions of research. Brilliant. <laughs> I think that's really a really pertinent point. And, uh, you know, I was trying to indicate with the, the sort of state of the, the SME uh, challenges in the UK today, the walls are moving in, right, the, for, for SMEs, I think. You know, the, what do we talk about? Polycrisis is the, the word of the moment, the, the challenge, you know, existential challenge after existential challenge applied on them of course many haven't survived 
um, and, and those that have are now facing more challenges and, and um, calls upon their resources and their, the, the remaining energy and, and you know, cash that they have left. So I think it is a real, it is a real question. Um, and I, I, I would love if we could try to understand the additional requirements. If we take net zero, for example, the requirements that are starting to come down on SMEs, um, how many are going to go out of business? because of that? Is that a necessary evil in order to adjust carbon emissions at a, at, at a level of our economy? Um, but what does it mean for those people whose livelihoods are taken away from them? And, and is there a, a real opportunity people talk about where they can just go into the green jobs and green, upskill in their green skills? I'm not so sure it's that easy. So I think, um, you know, there, I, I take your point. There is a, a real crisis for SMEs. I, the, when I speak to owner managers of small firms, I'm always struck by their their ability to find ways through and their the agency that they hold on to, which is perhaps why they're SME owner managers in the first place. But the challenges are real. And, you know, I think uh, the, the scale of the, the result, resolve to address these problems um, is, is substantive. But it's a really nicely put point. Thank you. Yeah, okay. Well, um, <clears throat> thank you uh, very much, dear audience, um, for your stimulating questions. I'm sure that you will agree tonight. We have indeed had from Laura some original thinking <laughs> uh, applied. Uh, you know, it's, it's easy to, uh, to, to think about these grand theories um, and forget the need to apply them in some policy or other practical way. So thank you very much <laughs> um, uh, for, for doing uh, that. So please join me in thanking Laura and Julia and Arti and Hongwei for a stimulating talk. Now, just as you're uh, leaving, we do have a full program of events here at Alliance Manchester Business School. So just to bring to your attention that uh, on Tuesday the 16th of May, uh, our vital topics will be uh, next vital topics lecture will be delivered by our own alumni, Stephen Critchlow, CEO and founder of Evergreen Life. And the topic of that lecture will be digital innovation and health technologies. If you look at the website, you'll find information on how to sign up for that. Thank you again and good night. <laughs>